Okay, well, well, maybe the first place to start has to be the same way in Regenesis. You started with the soil. You started, you, you kind of used the picking of the fruit in your old in the commons where, where, where that place where you used to live in Oxford was. And then you kind of took that as a gate, gateway to go into the soil. And I guess we've got a farm. We've got a four acre farm. All farm. regenerative. All regenerative. And I remember there last, a couple of weeks ago, Chris, who's our head farmer, he, he was showing me he had put a cocktail of seeds across uh, a bed that he wanted to kind of just let kind of go fallow for a, for, for a cover crop. A cover crop. And he put a cocktail of seeds on it. And there was a whole cocktail of seeds. And he said, what happens with this is it's going to pull forward different microbes, bring like bring different microbes to the surface. So when I plant it next, next uh, in spring, I've got a control. I want to see, I reckon this one here, because I've given it a cover crop and I brought forward different microbes, it's going to yield better f- foods and he was playing around with it and I just wondered there's a huge correlation between the human gut the human gut because obviously you know I think I, I read through your work that the plants guts are on the outside and it's in the soil yeah. and yeah. we're currently in a state of where the soil is in a state of dysbiosis so that means out of balance and humans are in a complete state of dysbiosis at large you know because the, the global western diet and stress and whatnot. And I just wondered, where does the food system link into this? There's a massive question to Big, jump off with. Go yeah. light and fluffy, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, I respect you too much to go in an easy one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, dysbiosis is is the right term. So you know, we, it's a term which comes out of medicine. You know, and it's about our guts being out of balance, but it's actually so appropriate for the home state of the planet um, and particularly for the state of the soil. Because as you say, the analogies are, are really powerful. You know, when a plant root, a baby rootlet, pushes into a lump of soil, it, it, it does a series of extraordinary things which we're only just beginning to understand. And the first of them is to start talking. And this is the amazing thing that plants can talk. And they talk in a very sophisticated chemical language. They, they, they release these very complicated chemicals called exudates from the root, whose purpose is to send a signal to the particular microbes they want to talk to. And in any lump of soil, there might be thousands of different species of microbes, most of which are asleep. They, they, they stay in a state of dormancy most of the time. And it doesn't want to talk to all of them. Uh, there might be pathogens in, uh, among them. There might be uh, sort of parasites among them, all sorts of microbes it doesn't want to, to, to deal with. So instead, it sends a specific signal which only one species can hear. In some cases, only one genotype of a species can hear. That's how precise it is. And, and that signal is basically saying, wake up. And the particular microbe which receives it said, oh, what, who, me? And, and at that point, the plant then floods them with sugars. So amazingly, between about 11% and 40% of all the sugars which plants make through photosynthesis they release through their roots to feed the microbes immediately around the root hair. And those microbes then using the sugars multiply very, very quickly. You know, they, they sort of wake up and they start producing all, all these baby microbes sort of budding off and off and off and off until you form around the root one of the densest microbial communities on earth. And, and, and that, as you say, creates around the root a kind of external gut for the plant. And it has these functions which are uncannily similar to the functions of the human gut. So, for instance, um, it, it exchanges the sugars it receives from the plant for, for nutrients which it extracts from the soil and feeds to the plant. And again, the, the, the microbes in our gut say they, they help to extract nutrients from our food and pass them to us in return for the sugars and other things that we feed them. They create a defensive ring around the root hair, fighting off pathogens, which is again exactly what the microbes in our gut uh, do. And they help to fire up the plant's immune system when it needs that help. And again, exactly the same in the gut. And what makes this really uncanny is that out of the thousand or so phyla of bacteria, the major groups of bacteria, there are four that dominate in the human gut. And there are four that dominate in this zone around the root hair. And they're the same four. So we've got this sort of spooky comparison between these two systems. Completely different large creatures, plants and humans, for instance, but almost identical relationships with the small creatures. And, and it seems particularly with creatures which are pre-adapted 
to cooperate with large with large ones. So these four groups of bacteria, you know, they're they're specialists in getting along with things a lot bigger than themselves. And so they form symbiotic relationships with them, similar to the relationships that you might get in a coral reef, for instance. And all this is going on under the ground. But of course, we're completely screwing this system over with our terrible treatment of the soil, but also, and you're quite right to make the analogy, you know, with our terrible, disastrous engagement with Earth systems as a, as a whole, and with the stripping out of the resilience of the global food system, which is beginning to look like the global financial system in the approach to 2008, with potentially catastrophic consequences, which we're just not attending to. Mm. Yeah, amazing. How fragile is our food system? So we, we have a cafe and we have about 60 products, all plant-based, that we distribute around Ireland. And I guess we're aware of how... Small changes, basil fluctuations, like during, we can get basil in Ireland about eight months of the year and we're looking at growing, we use about a quarter tonne a week. And during kind of times when there's kind of storms around the Mediterranean, we can't get basil, the price fluctuates, we might struggle to get it. It, it, It's tentative, it's delicate, it's, and I just wonder over the, uh, I've heard you talk about it previously where it's gone to a much more just-in-time production model in terms of how we manage the logistics of our global food system. And I just wonder how delicate and fragile is it? Because it's something that we take for granted. I can go down to the supermarket and not only is there food there, it's the exact, I can get chickpeas, I can get a particular variety of chickpeas. And COVID, can, and COVID was the first time that we saw that you heard these rumours that, well, there's only ever a week supply in a country. Like, you know, if, if things go wrong in Ireland or the UK or whatever... There's no good. We know food in a week, so people started stockpiling food and toilet rolls and whatever. And I guess it's it's just to to open up that conversation about the food, the global food system, and has it gone too efficient and too machine like and not local and human enough? Well, th- these are all all the right questions, and we take it for granted, don't don't we? You know, you go to the shops, the the, the shelves are going to be full of stuff. And I, I don't know about in Ireland, but just recently we've been going to the shops and all the shelves where there's meant to be tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, aubergines, courgettes, nothing, nothing, wow. just completely empty. And that's okay, exacerbated by Brexit, you know, and um, the immediate trigger has been cold weather in Spain and Morocco. But what we've seen since the 1970s now is an escalating series of shocks to the global food system. This is well documented in, in the scientific literature where the shocks are just been getting worse and worse and worse. And in a healthy system, we're talking about complex systems here. The soil is a complex system. Uh, every ecosystem is, the atmosphere is, the oceans are, the human brain is, human body is, human society, everything important to us in the whole world is a complex system. And they operate according to, to, to certain rules. And a healthy system is self-regulating. Um, it, it's uh, through billions of random interactions. It has these weird self-sustaining, self-regulating properties which keep it within an equilibrium state. But if you undermine the resilience of that system, if you uh, strip away some of the elements which make the system strong, those self-regulating features cease to function and shocks can travel easily across the system. And even worse, once it gets to a certain point, the self-regulating features become self-amplifying features. Instead, they multiply the shocks and make them worse and worse. And then the system gradually starts to approach a critical threshold. And if it passes that threshold, it doesn't respond in a slow, steady way. It just collapses from one equilibrium state to another. Now, that very nearly happened with the financial system in 2008. And, and it was because of the disastrous strategies of the big banks. For a start, they became too big. Too big to fail was the phrase we often heard then. They all started doing the same thing at the same time in the same way, which meant you stripped the diversity out of the system. You'd stripped the asynchronicity out of the system. In other words, they were doing it all in lockstep, which meant that anything going wrong was going to affect everyone all at the same time in the same way. They had created a, a sort of global standard for trading where you could just shift your currencies around. You, 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 there's no the national barriers have been taken down. So they, they broke down what's called the modularity of the system, which is another crucial element of resilience. 
they had made everything hyper efficient, which, you know, from their own individual perspective made sense, but collectively reduced the redundancy of the system, which is another of those crucial elements. They um, lobbied against effective regulation, and that meant that they stripped out the circuit breakers from the system, which is like the fifth element of sustainability. And then by in ensuring that everyone got integrated into this global economy, they stripped away the backup systems, which is the sixth element of, of, of sustainability within a system. So you can see there are six elements, um, diversity, asynchronicity, redundancy, modularity, circuit breakers, and backup systems, all of which are absolutely crucial for making sure that system can continue to function. If you get rid of them for what seemed like entirely logical corporate reasons, um, everybody pursuing their own interests, then the system as a whole becomes weaker and becomes prone to collapse. Now, in 2008, governments panicked. You know, they had like a few hours literally before the whole system went down and they bailed it out with trillions of dollars. And they were able to do that because they could just create money out of thin air. That's what governments do. And they did this thing called quantitative easing and these bailouts, they just produced money. They bailed out the banks with future money. But if the food system starts going down, you can't bail it out with future food. So it's a far more dangerous situation, even than the very, very close shave we came to with the possibility of financial collapse in 2008. Wow. So how delicate it is it? Like, are we carrying kind of a weak stock? Like I know, like say with the cafe or with that, you'll typically yeah. carry, you know, a weak stock of of dried goods because, you know, you can get a delivery yeah. next week. Like how delicate or, or kind of fragile yeah. is it? Are we talking weeks? Are we talking months? Like uh, it's obviously a, a very um, hypothetical question. Hypothetical. Hopefully, well, maybe not hypothetical. Who knows? Well, I mean, this, these are all crucial questions which everyone should be asking, but hardly anyone is. You know, people mm. say, oh, look, we've got a shock caused by... Um, cold weather in Morocco and Spain. No, we've got a shock caused by COVID. We've got a shock caused by Ukraine. You know, we see these individual shocks, but we don't recognize that actually there's a much deeper underlying trend. And since 2014, 2015 rather, we've seen uh, the rate of global chronic hunger rising. And that seems to be because of the increasing shocks to the system. So how fragile is it? Well, the problem with any complex system is you don't know where the tipping point is until you've passed it. You know, it, it's by the time you realize where that tipping point is, it, it, it's too late. Um, it's curtains, it's all, already been and gone. But we can see some pretty worrying signs which show that, you know, all the, all the warning signals that we saw with the financial sector are here in the food sector. So one is enormous corporations. To give one example, four companies now control 90% of the global grain trade. That is a really dangerous situation. And those same four companies have, have not only been um, doing mergers and acquisitions horizontally, capturing their rivals, they've also been integrating vertically. So they're, they're invested in seeds, in farm chemicals, in processing and packing facilities, um, in in wholesaling, in retail, I mean, right the way across the board, you know, those those companies are just swallowing up everyone and trying to sort of control the food system from farm to fork. And then at the same time, you know, they've been in, ensuring that you've got absolutely standardized ways of producing and dealing with this grain everywhere you are on earth. So you've got the same seeds being planted which is very dangerous, you know, because the genetic diversity has greatly shrunk. And so if you've got a major crop disease like the UG99 stem fungus, which is now raging across Africa and Asia with great damage to wheat crops, um, you know, because of there's so such low genetic diversity, there's almost nothing to stop the spread of that pathogen. Um, and then um, is all produced with the same chemicals, with the same techniques. So if there's, say, a run on... On NPK, you know, there's fertilizer mix, which relies very heavily on nitrates from Russia, phosphates from Western Sahara, whatever it might be. You, 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 suddenly everyone's got the same problem all at the same time. Then they insist, you know, all the, all the container terminals had to be identical. It's the same size shipping containers put on the same ships, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and 
and we see this great intensification of trade. There's been a far massively greater trading volume going on. Countries have polarized into super importers and super exporters, which adds to vulnerability in the system. And a great deal of that trade then passes through these very critical choke points. And one choke point, for instance, is the Suez Canal. And we saw in um, 2021 how um, the Suez Canal got blocked by that big container ship, the Ever Given, which got blown across it and got wedged in. Luckily, um, against expectations, they were able to free it in a few days. If they had had to unload it in order to float it off, it would have taken weeks. And had that um, problem coincided with the effective closure of the Turkish Strait, it's another critical choke point, by Russia's invasion of Ukraine the following year, the food chain would simply have snapped for hundreds of millions of people. If those two things had happened together, it would have been an absolute disaster. Shelves would have cleared across large parts of the Middle East, of, of North Africa, Southern Europe, there would have been really, really massive impacts and people people might have starved. You know, it, it, it would have been a really big problem. And there's a series of critical choke points. You know, we've got the Panama Canal, we've got the Straits of Malacca, we've got the Baba, B um, Baba Mandar, we've got the Straits of Hormuz. George, does it seem like one of the, the solutions to this is that if we, you know, going by Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, is the solution this that typically we need to go back to 80% of our food is locally grown. And um, it's grown within kind of the 100 kilometres of where we live as an ideal. I'm a dreamer and I That's a but, total idea. But, but, but just even ourselves yeah. with those starting our four acre farm, it connects yeah. you to the land you know yeah. what's in season you know how it's grown mm -hmm. your hand is in the soil you're actually yeah. being more like a human being than a human doing but so all that really. all that is true and valuable you know and and yeah you know, like you i love growing stuff i love that sense of connection but we must also recognize that there are mathematical constraints here and one of them is that you know whether we like it or not and we we tend to be very good at pushing this out of our mind we have become totally dependent on food from a long way away. And that's partly simply because of the distribution of the population versus the distribution of, of farmland. So many of, of the world's cities just don't have a big enough hinterland to produce crops um, for all the people who, who live in those cities. And so all of us now, just about worldwide, are dependent on transport from outside of that hinterland. There was a um, paper in Nature Food which looked at uh, how many of the world's people could be fed with, with grain from um, grown within 100 kilometers of where they live. And it's only 22% of, of the world's people. Um, and, and on average, I think for wheat, the um, average um, uh, minimum distance over which we um, can be fed is over 2,000 kilometers. Um, and so, you know, we're drawing in grain from the the U.S. Midwest, from the Canadian prairies, from the Brazilian interior, from from the Russian steppes, from the Ukrainian Chernozem, and and that leaves us vulnerable. But it's it's not an easy problem to fix because we we just don't in many countries have enough land to produce everything we need ourselves and. What we can produce, we, 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 we should produce, but only if it's not environmentally disastrous. So for instance, you know, you look at tomatoes, which is which is currently a, a, a hot issue in the UK. You know, tomatoes are this valuable commodity. People are almost coming to blows to get the last tomatoes. Um, and there's two things have happened at once. One, we've had the cold weather in Spain and Morocco, but two, because of the price of gas, Fewer people are growing them in heated greenhouses here in the UK. Now you would say, "Oh, we, you know, we should be growing our tomatoes in the UK." Uh, not if it means growing them in heated greenhouses, because that requires a massive amount of fossil fuels. And unless you've got purely waste heat, and a few people are using waste heat, which is reasonable, but if if you're looking at actually burning fossil gas to produce your tomatoes, you're much much better off in environmental terms trucking those tomatoes in from Spain where they're grown using natural sunlight. Um, it, it's simply because the emissions from the transport and the, all the other environmental impacts are smaller than the impacts caused by using that huge amount of, of, of fossil fuel to, to grow at home in an unfavorable climate. 
you know, during the summer, yeah, it absolutely makes sense to grow tomatoes here. But if we insist on having tomatoes in the winter, it doesn't make sense. You have, you have so much information. I, I'd love to bring the conversation back up because obviously we're very familiar with your work and I adore it. And I think for anyone listening, I'd love just to touch on the current issues of land use. I think we have sure. to get into that. And yeah. and what kind of the, 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 the modern diet is like, is the food system one of the main, like, I think we need to just bring it back up before we go back into other things. Yeah. And we need to talk about land use. We need to talk about, um, you know, the effect of climate change and what the current food system is doing on it. And I'd love if you could kind of give a little summary in terms of that, and then we can go off into loads of different other ways. Yeah, so, okay, um, it's something which people find really hard to swallow, but food production is the worst thing we've ever done to the planet. Wow. And obviously, you know, we've got to produce food. You know, we can't, you can't argue against producing food, but the way we do it is phenomenally damaging. So food production is the number one cause of deforestation this century, the number one cause of habitat destruction, the number one cause of wildlife loss, the number one cause of species extinction, the number one cause of soil degradation, the number one cause of fresh water use, um, and by far and away, the number one cause of land use, which is critically important. I'll come on to this in a moment. But it's also um, one of the biggest causes of water pollution. In the UK, for instance, there's more water pollution from farming than any other industry. Um, it is the number one top cause of water pollution, even worse than the horrible privatized water companies dumping raw sewage in our rivers. And also a very major cause of air pollution, which is something we almost completely forget about. But we've created a sort of moral force field around farming. You know, we don't criticize it. Um, we don't apply the same standards that we would to any, any other industry because it's so old, it's so deeply rooted in our, it's our food. lives, in our psyches. Yeah. And we, you know, you can't deny that we need it. But, you know, there's farming and farming. There are some forms of the farming which are just much, much more damaging than others. And the most damaging farming is livestock farming simply because of the enormous resources that it needs. So there's two kinds of livestock farming. You know, we can divide it quite neatly into two. One is the intensive factory farming, right? And everybody hates this. And yet they... And so just ju just just for anyone listening, so livestock, uh, you mean growing animals to eat? Yeah, meat. exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And is, yeah, fish, so, is fish considered as livestock? Well, so, so that, that's a whole other issue, but uh, equally horrendous. You know, it is... So industrial fishing is the biggest cause of the destruction of marine ecosystems. So, so that is, you know, that is horrendous as well. But I'm going to concentrate on talking about the things we grow, including, you know, we do fish in aquaculture, you know, like, like salmon farming and stuff. That is livestock production. Uh, but we're also talking about chickens, pigs, cows, sheep. Those are the principal species that, 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 that we're using. Um, in, 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 in that sort of order, you know, chickens most, then pigs, then cows, then sheep. Um, and so, and we're looking at when it comes to intensive production, you know, packing them into factories, these vast steel barns, which hardly anyone except for the people who work on the farm has ever been in. You know, these are about the, the most, that is, is like, is like GCHQ or, 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 or the CIA headquarters or something. You're, you don't the go in there. Triangle. Or yeah, Area exactly. 41 yeah. or whatever it's called. Yeah. You, 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 you're completely excluded from these places because if we if we did see where our food was coming from, the you know, the chickens or the pigs, for instance, you know, you would stop eating it tomorrow. It's it's terrible. It, it's really horrible. I I as a teenager I worked on an intensive pig farm. And every day there were two thoughts went around my head. The first was, this isn't what they told me farming was about. And the second was, why is this legal? You know, if we treated our cats and dogs the same way as we treat pigs and chickens, we would literally be sent to prison. And yet it's completely normal. It's just been totally normalized. You know, we're killing 76 billion animals a year to feed ourselves. So as well as um, having terrible welfare impacts, this also has terrible environmental impacts because um, uh, the, all these animals have to be fed on grain. This is incidentally where the great majority of our animal products come from, is from these huge steel factories. And people don't want to know this. There was a survey in the United States where over 95% of people eat meat. And it found that 47% of people wanted to ban slaughterhouses. 
And we just live in a total state of self-deception about this issue, but also about the environmental impacts. And the majority majority of meat comes from slaughterhouses, probably 80% of meat comes from factory farms, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the great majority comes from factory farms and it all passes through slaughterhouses. So so it's like just this sort of total, total self-deception, you know, and, and, and... yeah, we don't want to know. We still sort of old MacDonald, you know, that that's I mean, you know, there's two two absolutely catastrophic um um sort of forces of deception bearing upon them. One of them is old MacDonald had a farm and the other one is Ronald MacDonald. So you know, any any McDonald's, you don't want to go there. But you know, these sort of all is propaganda which is centuries old about, you know, what, what livestock farming is about. And it's just bullshit. So anyway, you've got a huge amount of grain being grown in places like Brazil, you know, where soya farming is just trashing the Sahado in- ecosystem, trashing the Gran Chaco in Argentina and Paraguay, trashing the southern Amazonian rainforest on a horrendous scale, almost entirely to produce feed for animals. Um, that's then transported to, to countries like our own, UK and Ireland. Um, and then it's passed through those thousands and thousands of animals packed into these great big steel sheds. Now, a lot of the nutrients in that feed is then pooped out in their manure. And that manure has to go somewhere and it's low value, high volume. So it's going to go somewhere locally. You can't afford to truck it across the country to where arable farmers might want it. So people spread it on the land and they call it fertilizing. But actually there's far too much because of the number of animals there's far too much for the land to absorb. The soil and the plants in it can't make use of those nutrients. So a huge portion of it runs off, goes into the nearest river, kills the river. River flows into the sea, you get dead zones at sea. So it's got these massive knock-on impacts, which we're just not thinking about. So that's intensive farming, and that's bad enough. So people say, well, I don't want to buy the products of factory farming. That's horrible. I hate factory farming. I like the kind of farming where you've got cows grazing in the meadow or sheep grazing on the hills. Organic that's local nice beef. I only eat organic <laughs> grass-fed right. beef. Pasture-fed, grass-fed, that's right. This is the worst of all farm products. You cannot eat a worse product than organic pasture-fed beef or lamb. And that is because of the enormous amount of a crucial resource which is required to produce that which is called land. Now, this should be one of the top of our environmental concerns. It should be right at the top. The amount of land we use is absolutely critical to our engagement with with the living world. And yet the only context in which we think about land use is when it comes to urban sprawl, right? And we should be exercised about urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is a pox on the planet. You know, it's it's really bad. It's bad for cities. It's bad for the countryside. But all the urban area on earth all the homes, all the businesses, all the infrastructure put together amounts to 1% of the Earth's land area, right? Farming occupies 38% of the Earth's land area. Uh, by far and away, the biggest use of, of, of land that humans do, much of the rest, incidentally, is desert, it's ice cap, it's um, r- rocky mountains. Um, uh, some is forest, not nearly enough. Some is protected area, not nearly enough. But basically, farming is occupying pretty well all the land it can. So how does that break down? Okay, 12% of the Earth's land surface is under crops. And nearly half of that land area producing crops is producing crops to feed to animals, to feed to those poor animals packed into those huge factories, um, the chickens and the pigs and the dairy cows and the rest of it. So, so, so just to so put that, that into context, so you've got 1% is all of the human urban environments and the yep. human ecosystem. Everything and six, we've ever built. And Everything we've ever built is 1%. 6% is just to grow grain to feed our animals that we like to eat. Uh, yeah, so nearly 6%. So so it's about, yeah, it's, it's 5 to 6%. And 6 to 7% is grain and fruit and veg and other crops grown directly to feed us, right? That's all, just six or seven percent of the land surface so we're, hang on a moment we're missing 26 percent i said that farming occupies 38 percent right and crops occupy 12 percent what's the 26 percent what's that all of that is pasture nearly all of it for cattle or sheep and and what this means is that cattle and sheep farming occupy this massively disproportionate proportion of the planet 
to produce a tiny amount of our food supply. I mean, it's really a minuscule amount of the, 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 the food we eat in terms of calories, in terms of protein, is produced by grazed cattle and sheep and, and, and the other animals that we might put out to pasture. And yet, what they do is to inflict a massive ecological opportunity cost and carbon opportunity cost. Because every hectare of land that we use for our own purposes is a hectare that can't be occupied by wild ecosystems. And the great majority of the world's species depend on wild ecosystems for their survival. They can't survive on those pastures. But moreover, the wild ecosystem displaced by that, that, that ranching, that, that pasturing, um, be they rainforest, be they natural grasslands, um, be they savannas, um, uh, be they wet, drained wetlands, whatever they might be, are always richer in carbon than, than, than the pastures that have replaced them. And so by, by keeping this massive uh, uh, global herd, well, it's actually not all that many, you know, the, the cattle and sheep are across a huge amount of land, we are displacing the ecosystems which could stop Earth systems collapse. So it's essentially the opportunity cost of because we're using 28% of land. 26. 26% of the land to grow cattle on. We could, that could be forest or that could be wetlands, which would absorb a lot exactly. more carbon and give a lot more stability to the whole Earth's natural systems which exactly. support life. So essentially the food system is the greatest cause of... Of, of impact on the current climate situation, which is compounding, further compounding and stressing our current food system and putting That's it in right. a state of possible brink. That's right. And when people say, oh, the problem is intensive animal farming, you say, no, 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 no. The problem is animal farming. You know, intensive is bad. Extensive is even worse in environmental terms. Extensive, by definition, means using more land to produce a given amount of food. Okay, so there was a study in the United States saying, what, what if we were to do what all the celebrity chefs are telling us to do, which is to eat pasture-fed beef. You know, stop eating this horrible corn-fed beef in these intensive feedlots, but eat pasture-fed beef in, instead. And it found out that if you were to do that, the amount of land required to produce cattle would rise by 270%. And so if the United States were to, to make that move, it would have to fell all its forests, drain all its wetlands, water all its deserts, degazette all its national parks, demolish all its cities, and it would still be importing most of its beef from Brazil. Oh my wow. word. That's a great stat. That's a great <laughs> That's piece of research. That's frightening. Okay, grants. This is a topic that, well, I guess we grew up in Ireland. Or yes, we grew up in Ireland. We still live here. We do, correct. Uh, but where there was the what Common was Agricultural Policy, policy where, it was all, where it was cap, where it was, it, now I'm ignorant to this, but I, to the best of my knowledge, this is back in, you know, early 90s, there was, the government was funding farmers to get into growing animals because they needed more beef because this was one of our prime economic activities. Is grants a significant part of the cause? Are we are we indirectly paying taxes to governments and then governments are using it to, in a way that is not intentionally, but is having this massive ramification and ultimately kind of leading to this climate crisis? Yeah, it, it's it's one of the most perverse forms of public spending on earth, in, 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 which is farm subsidies. We're talking about half a trillion dollars a year worldwide being spent on farm subsidies and almost none of them have any environmental benefits. Nearly all of them are directly environmentally harmful. Um, the majority of those subsidies almost certainly being spent on livestock farming. It, it's really perverse. And within the European Union, it's actually worse than anywhere else on earth. Now, look, I'm a staunch Remainer, right? I massively hated Brexit and I greatly regret that Brexit has happened, but there is one good thing and only one good <laughs> thing that has come out of Brexit, which is getting out of the European Union's common agricultural policy, which is an absolute catastrophe. And it appears to be unreformable, unreformable because every five years the EU says, well, yes, we recognise there are some problems with the common agricultural policy, so we're going to have a new round and we're going to consider applications and we're going to th think again about it. And they come out they make it even worse than it was before because they're completely nobbled by these huge agricultural lobby groups operating at the European level. And so what the Common Agricultural Policy does, and it's by far the biggest budgetary item, incidentally, in, in, in the European Union. So everyone in the EU is paying loads of money out of their pockets for this, is it pays people by the hectare, which means the biggest landowners get the most money. 
you know, and you don't have to be a European, you know, you can be a, 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 a Texas mining baron, you can you can be an, a, a, a Saudi oligarch sheikh, you can be a Russian oligarch, you know, as long as you own land within Europe, you qualify for these subsidies. So they're taking it out of our pockets, putting it into the pockets of some of the richest people in the world. And the condition of having that money for pillar one of the common agricultural policy is that your land is kept in agricultural condition. In most jurisdictions, you don't actually have to produce anything from that land. You don't have to produce a single ear of wheat, a single lamb chop, a single pint of milk. It just has to look as if it's agricultural land. That's what agricultural condition means. It has to look as if farming can take place there. And what that means is bare. If the land contains what the rules call permanent ineligible features, a red ring is put around those permanent ineligible features and they don't qualify for subsidies. What is a permanent ineligible feature? Wildlife habitats. Um, and we've seen right across the European Union as a result of this perverse incentive, hundreds of thousands of hectares of prime wildlife habitat being destroyed solely in order to qualify for pillar one of European farm subsidies. It's, it's just utter madness. It's one of the most destructive forces on earth today, and it's entirely driven by state funding. And it's the, and it's the same in terms of like how I understand it as like we grow vegetables, but I don't think there's that much grants for vegetable growers. It seems no. like most of the grants, certainly in Ireland, go towards dairy production or meat production, which, as you've kind of said, the the livestock production is one of the biggest causes of the the current climate situation. Not all, and and also a huge contributor to human health issues. Ill health yeah, issues. yeah, totally, Ill totally. Ill health, yeah. So, so you're not going to get anything for your four hectares because it's paid by the hectare. I mean, it would not be worth your while to fill in the forms. You'd be spending more of your time and money filling in the forms than any tiny amount of money you got from farm subsidies for four hectares. But if you we had four hundred acres, ours is four acres. Oh, so four acres. Smaller. Sorry, well, even less. Smaller. Yeah. But if you had four hundred acres or four thousand acres, then it's really worthwhile. And of course. You know, on the whole, the biggest farmers are the ones who got livestock because they're very extensive, you know, and they'll occupy huge areas of, 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 um, uh, of, of mountain, hillside, uplands, you know, and, and that's where, you know, it's really lucrative to be farming subsidies. Now, I don't know about in Ireland, but, but here in Britain, in the UK, we get uh, endless programs on, on the telly, you know, BBC particularly showing sort of, ah, oh, these, these rugged sheep farmers herding their sheep around. I mean, if BBC were any keener a sheep, it would be illegal, <laughs> right? But, but the, and, and, and what they never show you in these programs is how these people actually make their money. You know, they take their sheep to market. Oh, I've got a good price on this one. Oh, yes, that's great. Oh, yes, no, I like the body on this one. So give me a good price. All of that is loss making. Every sheep you sell loses you thirteen pounds on average, uh, and, and and you make a loss. And the average English hill farm makes minus sixteen thousand six hundred pounds a year, right? The uh, the economic activity is subsidy harvesting, and it's because you've got this large area of land which you're keeping in in agricultural condition because you've got sheep grazing it to make sure that no saplings come up, no no scrub happens, no, no, no wildlife can recover there, you get paid by the hectare for that land. So the actual business of the farm is sitting at the computer filling out subsidy forms, but somehow that hasn't caught on as a romantic activity. Wow, it was frightening when you look beneath the veil. I think it's human Let activity. We've become quite perverse yeah. in so many different it, it, ways. It's, it's, it's kind of a bit in the state of like busy fools, like us as humans, us being the ants on the planet. And yeah. we're kind of like, we're all busy, you know, existing, but slowly, indirectly, our actions are ultimately leading us towards a p possible, you know, I've, I've heard people call it the possible sixth extinction event. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, I, I think probable on the trajectory we're on, it, it is probable. You know, through this just perversity of all the all the the pressures which are bearing upon the planet, but you know, of all the I, I will I will answer. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, of, no. of all these pressures, right? The number one and number two, and I don't know if they're in that order or the other way around, are fossil fuels and livestock production. And so, if if we want to protect and restore the living planet, there are two principal things we need to do: leave fossil fuels in the ground and stop farming animals.
Brilliant. Wow. Okay, I've got two. I think we need to start the the, the, the journey, the, the journey, the, the hero's movement. journey. We into need solution. hope. We need hope, yeah. George. <laughs> yeah. First thing to start with for anyone listening who kind of goes right. I agree with everything you're saying, George. What should people largely be eating? So first of all, you know the the biggest shift that you can make in your own life. You know, and I'm always saying to people, you know. Don't think of yourself as a consumer. Think of yourself as a citizen. It's by getting together that, and making political change that we, we, we're powerful. However, there are one or two things you can do in terms of your own consumption which really count. One of them is the way you travel, but the biggest shift of all is to switch to a plant-based diet. That has by far and away the biggest impact that you can have. And the reason for this is that animal farming and animal consumption, obviously, which is driving animal farming, and we in the rich nations are big, big drivers of it. So in the UK, we consume on average 82 kilograms of, of meat per person per year, which is roughly our body weight. In the US, they consume 118 kilograms per person per year, which is, and no, I won't go there. Um, the, <laughs> and, um, and, 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 you know, that is this huge driver because those livestock interact with just about every earth system. They're hammering just about every ecosystem, just about the hammering atmosphere, rivers, oceans, everything, you know, all the way across water, from fresh water, soil, the, the, the lot, every habitat, you know, just being hit by livestock production. So, so getting out of that and into a plant-based diet, that number one, before you do anything else, you've made a big shift in your environmental impact. So, so, so that statistic, there was a statistic which we've been quoting, it was out of an Oxford study, which said in 2018, the single biggest thing you could do as an individual for, to, for, to, for the climate, for the benefit of the planet was to shift to a plant-based diet and not, you know, it's not about electric cars and planes. Obviously, right. all those things help, not yeah. flying as much and whatnot. But they said the most agency you have in terms of your diet. Yeah. Okay, that hope, seems George, to be we need but, hope. We need yeah. hope. Yeah. Hey, I, I just wanted to, is that correct? Is that correct? Yeah, Sorry. no, no, that is, is correct. So, so for instance, if you look at transport, you know, we, we, we're slightly obsessed with transport we should be concerned about it, but livestock farming alone, let alone any other farming, livestock farming alone has greater greenhouse gas emissions than all global transport. Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay, hope the future. How can we solutions. turn this around, George? What are the solutions? How can we suddenly kind of go from the, the state with which we're approaching our food system now to kind of creating a new utopia, sustainable system so that our grandchildren, our great, great, great grandchildren can just have a wonderful utopian existence. So for yeah. the first step of that is, so what are some possible exciting solutions? And then we've got to talk about how do we, or is yeah, there a potential yeah. pathway to get to them? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, okay. So let, let's look for a moment at grain because grain is really, you know, we're all great at talking about fruit and vegetables, right? Because we, we all tend to grow a few fruit and vegetables. None of us grow grain. I don't suppose you guys are growing grain, right? Yeah, people we have, a, we have a sourdough bakery and it's something it that I've, you know, we have a little mill and it's something that I've aspired to do is to grow even a small bit. We were Charles Dowding back last year and he was growing a small bit of rye which he'd mill himself and, and make, make his, his own, own sourdough he and was just, very rare though I it's love really it. tough in that it's tough and labour intensive to grow your own grain really really hard you know you can see why it's oh, all he was growing about a, me a metre square that was right. the extent yeah. of his okay. arable pasture <laughs> sure so so you know the, the, one of the mistakes we make we sort of think about the vegetables we grow and think oh that's the way to feed the world but actually you know you've got to crack grain and if you don't get grain growing right you're not going to solve any of these problems. So, I, I, you know, while there are some really fascinating new ways of growing fruit and veg, which I'm also very interested in talk about in the book, I'd like to emphasize the grain because so almost all the grain we grow, right, is is from annual crops, right, crops which live and die within within one year. And large areas covered by annual crops are, are rare in nature and generally only happen in the wake of a disaster, right, landslide, volcanic eruption, big fire, that sort of thing kills off everything that creates bare ground. And that's what annual plants like to colonize. And they colonize it very rapidly. They're specialists in colonizing bare ground. And then the perennial, the long-lived plants come in and drown them out and, um, and, and it sort of closes up again. Um, so in order to grow our annual crops, we have to create a disaster every year. Right? We have to clear the land. We have to kill everything that's living there, either by spraying it or by plowing it. And then we have to keep killing. As the little seedlings come up, we have to protect them against all the competition, wiping out other plants, wiping out the bugs which might eat them, fertilizing them, watering them is really intensive. So what if instead we could grow perennial grain crops? 
um, crops which only need to be planted every few years, but you can harvest them every year. You can just keep harvesting from the, the same plant. The idea of it sounds like the it's greatest like a fruit hack. It's like, it's like a hack because it's almost like, yeah. like a fruit tree is the way fruit is grown, but grain is grown annually and that's I the know. way we're all taught. So the idea that's of right. a grain that gives you a crop every year and, and you just do very little, it's like... And to give no. a context for anyone listening, by grain we mean wheat, barley, rye, rice. Do you include rice as part? Oh yeah, of no, no. So yeah, all yeah. the cereal crops, and yeah. you mentioned some of them, but also oh. um, included in grain is oil seeds. So the things like yeah, rapeseed, sunflower, whatever it is, yeah. Um, but also included in that is is legumes. So beans, pulses, peas, you know, or wow. lentils. Or all, all that is grain. So all these could be planted once, and they could last for five or six years. You get yeah, a crop yeah, every year. Yeah. That's right. Oh, That's right. And so, so this has been a dream of scientists, right, for a century, and it's finally happening. At last, it is happening. It's been driven by a small group in in the US called the Land Institute, uh, working with other groups around the world, and they've been scanning thousands and thousands of candidate species, uh, which could be turned into perennial species or crossed with existing annual crops, and they've already had one total success: full commercialization which is a variety of short grain rice. So they basically crossed short grain rice with a wild perennial relative and it worked. And they've now got this crop, which um, has been in the ground for several years. It still produces uh, yields as high or higher than the annual r rice that replaced it. It's been grown across thousands of hectares. They did it in conjunction with the Yunnan University in China, grown across thousands of, of hectares in Southern China and the farmers are desperate for the seed. They, they're they really, really keen for this because, number one, it massively reduces soil erosion because by plowing the paddy fields every year, you, you're massively degrading the soil. But if you don't only have to plow them every several years, the soil can recover. You don't do nearly so much damage. It massively reduces the costs of farming because you're not using as, as much water, as much pesticide as much um, herbicide as much fertilizer all these damaging inputs but also they're really short of labor in rural china because the young people have gone to the cities and it means much less labor you're not having to plant every year and wow. and yet they're harvesting again and again and i've eaten the um the the, the rice which comes um from these nice. plants is exactly it is just short grain rice it's the same stuff but it's from a perennial plant Wow. And now they've got a whole load of other plants like this in the pipeline. It's really exciting. So this is kind of like high-tech kind of sophistication, kind of cross-breeding, allowing kind of a perennial mm. wild grass to be mixed mm. with kind of a, uh, an edible annual. varietal annual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and you know, the, the breakthroughs, it hasn't been all that fancy, the technology required. You know, the, the, I mean, selective breeding is a much more sophisticated thing than it used to be. But it's basically... In that case, you know, that was a simple cross. In other cases, they've just stumbled across wild species which have got great potential. And some of them, you know, seem very promising and then they go nowhere. Others don't seem very promising and suddenly boom, they're able to multiply up the amount of grain they're producing just through a few generations of, of selective breeding. And so there's a whole load of different potential crops in the pipeline now. Well, I've eaten another one called Kernza, which um, is... It, it comes from a plant which is it's just a grass, really. It's a deep-rooted perennial grass, very, very thick, deep roots, go down several metres. Um, so you, they need less water, they need less fertiliser than the straggly little tiny more roots. More mineral rich as well, because they're gone deeper. Uh, say, say that again? And more, they're going to be more mineral rich because yeah, the yeah, deeper Yeah, that's roots, right, that's yeah. right, all of that. And they're likely to be more resilient to pests. Um, they don't get swamped by weeds because they're big, thick, bushy plants. They're also more resilient to environmental shocks. So, for instance, the Land Institute has got this perennial sunflower. It was growing it alongside a block of annual sunflowers, got hit by a big drought, completely wiped out the annual sunflowers, and the perennials just sailed straight through it. <laughs> so, so I've been Amazing. eating flour from um, this crop they've produced called Kernza, which is a totally different species. It's a species you know, humans haven't been eating before, but it's a grass species just like wheat or barley or anything. And it produces this fantastic flower. It's, it's rich and nutty tasting. It's a really lovely flower. And I've made, I've made bread with it. I've made wraps with it. I've made digestive biscuits with it. I've made savory crackers with it. And they're all just lovely. I mean, it's got such a good flavor. The yields are still quite low, so they're doing some work on that to, to, to raise the yields. But you know, as a product, it is it couldn't be better.
And do you okay, see this same. rolling out? Do you see this kind of hit and mass proliferation? Like, will there be much pushback? People going like, well, that that wouldn't be classified. That's just simple crossbreeding. That's not genetic modification. That's just simply pairings. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't think we'll get much. Pre- I mean, the, the question is, you know, whether farmers can adapt it into their systems. You know, whether they can make good use of it. And there are issues like, you know, could these perennial plants become weeds, which cause us a problem when we try to switch back to annual plants? For instance, you know, there's questions like this, which are perfectly legitimate questions. So there's some issues that need to be resolved. With the rice, there don't seem to be any problems. You know, it's just like, yeah, it just fits straight into the farming system. Might not be the same for all crops, but, you know, you, there's just more work need, needs doing on them. Incredible. It's an amazing one. And uh, so, so we're very keen for mentors. You know, we have been for a long time with a sourdough bakery and we make we make bat, batch, huge batches of kimchi and sauerkraut and whatnot. And we so, roast coffee. And we roast coffee and, and Stevens into chocolate. So lots of kind of fermented fermented products. And I know a solution which you are a big believer in is precision fermentation, which which people go, fermentation? Well, well how is precision fermentation could potentially feed the world. How could, yeah, could yeah. you tell so, us about that? So, so for twelve thousand years or so, we've been we've been concentrating on selecting and breeding and growing multicellular organisms, right? Plants and animals. We pretty well push them to the absolute limit. When it comes to chickens, we push them way beyond the limit. You know, into just appalling welfare, health issues. Um, but we've scarcely begun to explore the potential of of microbes, and microbes are incredible. I mean, they need just so much less than plants and animals need in order so when to you grow say, them. When you say, when you say microbes, because obviously you think of yeah. mammals, okay, chickens, yeah, got it, meat, you know, Correct. vegetables, yeah, got it. But microbes, it's a harder yeah. thing for people to get their head around. Like, yeah. we can't see a microbe. No. The microbe is, a, is, a, is, is nothing. It's in the air. Like, it's... Yeah. And we're scared of microbes too, because oh, some, some microbes are germs. Yeah, sure, you know. Um, some fish are poisonous to eat, but that doesn't mean that all fish are poisonous. Yeah, it's a very, very small proportion of germs that are out of millions of microbial species. And a huge amount of them have food potential. So you've been using certain microbes, principally yeast. Um, with kimchi, I think you're using bacteria, aren't you? With sourdough, I think you're using bacteria to some extent as well. And you're using it in a really interesting way, but it's 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 sort of traditional fermentation, whereas precision fermentation is really about homing in on a particular microbe and multiplying that deliberately as as a sort of end in itself. You know, you're not using it to turn um, wheat into bread, to turn flour into bread. You're using it to, to to make more of itself, and. And it turns out to be super efficient as a way of creating protein-rich, fat-rich foods. So um, there was one study showing that um, if you were to um, make uh, um, a protein from um, bacteria feeding on methanol, and there's some bacteria which can just eat methanol, there's others which can just eat hydrogen, um, you would need 1,700 times less land than the most effective way of making protein currently, which is growing soya. And that means you need 132,000 times less land than you do for making beef. We, depending on the energy technologies you're using, including the energy required, you could grow all the world's protein in an area the size of Greater London. Yeah, which you know, is the average oh. Irish county you probably produce all the world's protein. And I'm not suggesting we do it like that. It should be distributed. There's all sorts of reasons for having a broken up system, but it's it's... It's got enormous potential to save land, to save water, to save fertilizer. But it kind of takes a huge shift in people's heads because they go precision fermentation. Does that mean that I just get into the supermarket and I buy a tub of microbes and I just eat <laughs> protein-rich microbes? Or what? Do, like, what does this look like? Is this the same as we use textured vegetable protein or soya protein or things like this? So, so I mean, no more than we go into the supermarket and buy a live pig, right, and take it home to butcher it. Um, the so the, these these microbes, just like your pig or your chicken, you know, are the are the starting point of the products which you might want at at, at the end, and, and they've got this a far greater potential to replace animal products than plants have. And the, you know, the problem with plant proteins is that there are low concentrations in the plant. They they're very different to animal proteins. And they're tangled up with all these plant secondary metabolites, which are generally very strong tasting. So you need a lot of processing to turn plants into animal-like things. You need far less processing to turn microbes into animal-like products. Um, And so there's enormous potential for replacing dairy, for replacing meat, for replacing fish, 
for replacing eggs, just making much, much better substitutes than you can make out of plants. But I think we'll quickly start going beyond that and start saying, well, actually, there's all sorts of other things you can do with that, which we can't even imagine at the moment any more than the first farmers to capture a wild cow were thinking about camembert. <laughs> and then I, is this efficient? Will this be economical? Like, will it end up being kind of Cause, a, cause affordable even was, for people? Even I was saying to Steve yesterday, I was saying this preci- precision fermentation thing, it's incredible. Like, how do we get into Like, this is like the Wild West. Like, people, I don't, I, like, we're in the food industry, but I'd never heard of this before. And I'm like, do we just start like a chamber and start breeding certain microbes? <laughs> like, I have no idea how it works, like as a food, someone in the food game. Well, so I basically let the pioneers sort it out and make their mistakes and lose, you know, some of them will lose money, some of them will succeed, you know, it's, it's, it's always at the beginning. And before the small guys can start using it, you know, you need the big money to fail and fail and fail and then succeed. And some of them are now succeeding. Some of them are doing fine and, and some of them aren't. That's always going to be the case with any new technology. But once they've cracked it, the cost then comes rocketing down. And, and, and very quickly, it'll start to undercut animal products because you just need far less of everything. You need far less land, far less water, far less fertilizer, far less everything to, to produce these products. And, and, and it's basically modular. It's like digital production. So, you know, you're going to have that S curve, you know, where it sort of bumps along the bottom and then slowly rises till you reach about 10% uptake and then it goes straight up to universal uptake, you know, just like with phones, just like with light bulbs, just like with fridges, you know, all the major technologies we've adopted, that's what's happened. Wow. Microbe farming. It's just, it's such a thing to get your head around. It's amazing. Okay. So there's, there's possible. Okay. So we've got annual crops and we've got perennial crops, per, perennial crops and we've got microbial farming. They're about two incredible, interesting things. And how, I, I guess the biggest thing is, and that this was a conversation which we had on the farm on Saturday, we were planting trees, planting trees around the, the outside of the farm. And th- there's a lovely French man, Matteo, and he was chatting to us and he was saying, and he's, he's got a number of kids and he was saying, well, there's lots of young people now in France and they're not having kids because they have a despair about the future. And I just wondered like, I can understand his predicament and I can understand a lot of people's predicament with that perspective. And I kind of gone, okay, we've talked about two possible future solutions and I'm sure you've got another array of them and you go through a lot of them in your, in your book, Regenesis. I'm going like, what are some of the stepping stones that we can get there to avoid the potential catastrophes of mass starvations because the food system is so under stress and it's got so hyper efficient that it doesn't have any slack in the system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So talking to kids, I've got one minute before I've got to leave and pick up my daughter from school. Oh, but, there we are. Um, Great. Yes. So I, <laughs> I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and get this in fast. Um, yeah. And look, we, we need to just change the system. And the first thing to do is to understand the system. And scarcely anybody does. People just aren't bothering to get to grips with complex systems and how they operate. And we've got to understand it in the same way that we've now begun to understand the financial system and where that went wrong. We're seeing the food system go wrong in the same way. And this is where it's so important that we are citizens, not just consumers, that we actually step forward and put, get together, mobilize together, put pressure on governments and say, this food system is crocked. If you don't act on it now, it's going to go down and it's going to take us all with it. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's an environmental imperative, but it's also a humanitarian imperative because we are all stuffed unless we sort this food system out. Well, actually, we won't be stuffed. We'll be starving, but then we'll be stuffed because we're starving. We, you know, we're, we're in really big trouble now, and we've got to cooperate, come together in huge numbers and demand political change. In terms of coming together, I'm in Exeter on April the 13th. Do you want to have lunch? Oh, it sounds great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, I'd love to. I'm in Exeter. George, you're in Tottenham. I'd George, love you're to spend amazing. Time. You really are. We're two total fanboys. Love your work. Your book, Regenesis, is incredible. It's won a number of awards. Anyone listening who wants to learn more, do check it and out. And dig it's into phenomenal. George. has got amazing videos on YouTube. The one in the Yellowstone Park about the wolves and the reintroduction is just mind boggling. And oh, I just, I, I will. I'll send you an email. I'm there. I'm doing a talk with Dr. Alan Desmond on, in Exeter oh, on the 13th. Fantastic. No, I know. Yeah, he really Brilliant. is. So, yeah. so I'll send you an email. Like, I'm there. I've booked flights. So I'm, I'm in. Texas on the 13th so I'll send you something and we'd love to meet in person well look it's been a total pleasure to talk to you both thanks guys it's been lovely thanks Thanks, George thanks Thanks, George you're a star really 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 appreciate it mind yourself bye 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 Bye. 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 as someone who's worked in the food industry for almost 20 years now it's rare you meet someone that can tread so many different aspects 
together so coherently that my brain feels partly scrambled because I've just been exposed to so much information. But at the same time, I feel inspired. I feel ignited. I feel like he like, treads so many pieces together of the puzzle, as in the planetary situation, the food system, linking it to the the the, the way the financial system was in two thousand and eight, um, and just really back down to plausible solutions of. Go eat more plant-based or eat exclusively plant-based if you can, because as he said, in terms of land use, animal agriculture, livestock, whether intensive or pasture is really is the number one one or or two um, cause of climate crisis in the current climate situation. So in terms of healing the food system, I guess the number one agency we have is eating more plant-based foods. I love the topic of rather than being a consumer, be a citizen. Yeah, and I'm fascinated with um, precision fermentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't know how to learn more about that. But, um, perennial crops. Yeah, do check out George. His his latest book is Regenerous, which, Regenesis, Regenesis. which is fascinating. It's He's won a number of awards, so it's an incredible book for anyone who's interested in the food system and likes that. he It's phenomenal. Read. Yeah, and he's got a column in The Guardian, which he writes in regularly as well. So um, do check him out. And thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. And I guess this 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 was such a treat for us because um, it just trended game. so many aspects that we're so interested in together. So yeah, hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for being on this podcast journey with us. We really, really appreciate you. Cheers. Bye. 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 Wish bye, you bye. a good day ahead. Bye.